Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the London School of Economics and uh, for this evening's event. My name is Kei-Yu Jin. I am an associate professor of economics uh, in the economics department and also a member of the Center of um, Macroeconomics. So I'm very pleased tonight to uh, welcome Darshini, Dollar, uh, Darshini to the LSC today. Darshini is an economist, broadcaster, and author with many successful careers in various arenas, including a former one in finance. So the breadth and depth of her experience, uh, whether working as an economist for HSBC or a journalist for Sky News, makes her uniquely suited to address one of the most important subjects of the global economy. So I'm personally fascinated by the title of the book, The Almighty Dollar. Now I wonder, is this gonna be a praise of the dollar and its strength, or does it carry a tinge of irony in uh, the title? So I'm very curious uh, to find out what your view is about this very important uh, subject, but it's also a very timely subject. I mean, one of the most striking global trends today is the emergence of emerging markets and they are demanding more and more dollars by the day. So will the US be able to supply this dollar with, you know, smoothly without any doubt about the sustainability of the deficits that it's facing? I mean, it's also very timely today because uh, usually behind the, the, on the back of, you know, having a reserve currency is this great fiscal capacity, which of course today with um, the US president and um, uh, his, um, his team have, uh, you know, uh, just slightly brought a, a challenge to whether that is uh, going to be able to serve um, the dollar's role. So as these economies grow, thrive, and expand, fusing with the global financial world, um, why is the dollar so important for the course of their development? Uh, will there be another time when other reserve currencies will be on the rise? I think these are some of the very important questions for the future. Um, but today, we welcome Darshini to hear her speak more about how the trillion of, or so of worth of dollars which are floating around the world, um, how that illuminates the workings of globalizations, both its challenges and its opportunities. So for those uh, Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is uh, hashtag LSE dollar. Uh, I would ask you to please put your phones on silent uh, so as to not disrupt the event. Uh, this evening's event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical, technical difficulties. And as usual, after the lecture, there will be a chance for you to ask questions and there will be a book signing taking place uh, following the event. Copies of The Almighty Dollar will be on sale outside the venue. But now, will you please join me in welcoming Darshini to LSE to deliver her lecture entitled The Almighty Dollar. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, and I should just answer one of your questions before I go any further, which is about what, what the almighty dollar actually stands for. I did get a phone call from a TV producer who got very excited uh, because the almighty dollar, they immediately assumed, must be part of the blueprint for making America great again. Um, but I was, had to disappoint her and say, in actual fact, you're not going to find it. I don't think by the bedside of the current president of the United States, although I could be wrong. Um, May I first say thank you for having me back at the LSE. It's been a few years since I was last here, uh, more than a few years, in fact. In fact, when I was last here, I was an economist working for the government. Uh, I was working for a chap called Ken Clark, who was then the chancellor, so it was a very long time ago. In fact, I think the Spice Girls may have been at number one, or it could have been Take That. And the discussion at the time was all about whether or not the UK would be joining this new currency called the Euro. Um, a lot has changed since then. Uh, we are uh, uh, some years on from there, and much has changed, although apparently Ken Clark is still uh, to be found skulking around various corridors in Westminster. The Spice Girls are talking about reforming, and take that, is still hovering around the top 10. But we have seen, uh, of course, a whole new debate arising, and that is to do with a growing distrust in economic systems as they are at the present, 
Um, we've seen the rise of populism, and that's been expressed at the ballot box, of course, uh, here in the UK, over in the US, and most recently in Italy as well. What hasn't changed over this time is that we're told that people don't care about economics. Ordinary people don't care about economics. They don't understand it. It doesn't matter to them. And even if they did get it, there's nothing they could do about it. We're all apparently subject to invisible forces. And I disagree with that wholeheartedly. So hence why I came back to reading, let's see if this, oh, there we go, The Almighty Dollar. Uh, the follow the incredible journey of a single dollar to see how a global economy really works. Uh, I'm going to try and take in a bit of a whistle-stop tour uh, around some of those countries there. There's not much we can do in half an hour that's, you know, half the length of the average episode of McMafia, but let's see how we get on. Uh, let's start off by talking about whether or not it is true that the economy is simply too complex for us to understand. This is, uh, well, we recognise the top two pictures there, Davos, World Economic Forum, taken at the start of the year. Why is that important? I think those kind of pictures encapsulate how people feel about economics today. The fact that the dismal science has now become the distant science. And I mean that in the sense that, you know, I was um, at Davos earlier this year at the World Economic Forum, and we're told it's the great and the good. It's Davos, man, and yes, they are mainly men out there still. Um, it's business leaders, it's political leaders, and they are sitting there eating their, you know, $50 croque monsieurs, and they're getting ready to check into their $1,000 per night hotel rooms, so this is no exaggeration. And they're wringing their hands and talking about what can be done about poverty and inequality to a soundtrack of champagne corks popping. And that is, uh, you know, that's the highest town in Europe, Davos. So it can feel very remote, and it feels very cut off from the lives of ordinary people. It's not just um, Davos, of course. Uh, there we've got you know, financial markets. And again, you know, they're the casinos where the money men and women are taking bets, million, trillion, billion dollar bets, on issues that affect all of us. But quite often, we get to feel that that's something that is remote, even though what they're doing there has a real impact on profits, on incomes, GDP, jobs, the rest of it. So what does this all mean? Well, it comes to things like you know, the referendum and it comes to things like the US election. What we tend to hear about is the politics, of course. It's about the personalities, not the policies. It's about the spin. It's about the speculation. It's not the facts. So how do we cut through all of that? And I think, you know, it's quite a simple way of looking at this. I think it comes down, frankly, to the dollar. So why the dollar? Well, it all boils down to the fact that, uh, you know, you can call it what you will, those notes. Um, well, many names, actually. The dollar's called the dead presidents. It's called Buck, a greenback. But ultimately, the dollar is what underpins our entire financial system. It underpins our entire global economy. We talk about globalization. Globalization is, okay, so what keeps the wheels spinning? What keeps the wheels really spinning is the dollar. It's that common currency of globalization. Why is that? Well, it's the international currency of trade. It's the bedrock of the central banks, we were saying. It's that reserve currency. And it's remained as such, despite the rise of the euro, despite the rise of China's currency. And of course, we've now got additional currencies coming up. Uh, what does that all mean? It's also seen as one of the safest ways of holding money. 40% of the world's debts, um, be they private or public, denominated in dollars. And when it comes to instability, when it comes to financial crises, when it comes to economic crises, whether or not they're affecting America or not, what we tend to find is the dollar pops up time and time again. It's not pesos they've got under the bed in Argentina when things go a little bit crazy. It's dollars. It's seen as the safest store of value. And one of the things that uh, I found particularly surprising when I started looking into the dollar was the fact that, in actual fact, when you talk about dollar notes, you talk about even the electric forms, the electronic forms of dollars, over half of them are actually outside of the US. They're not within, I won't say walls just yet, the borders of those states. Um, and that means that is the way that our financial system is flowing. It's flowing because of all those dollars. Uh, so let's just take a closer look at that because I've gone back now. There we go. There's our dollar. So it's quite simple, doesn't it? But when you look at it a bit, 
bit more closely, and this is the interesting bit, the history of the dollar, because it is a truly global currency. Why do I say that? Well, the dollar's not actually American at all. Uh, the dollar was actually originally known as the thaler, and it was first minted in Bohemia, as it was then, which is now the Czech Republic. And it was originally the name given. It came from, the name actually came uh, from the town in which it was minted. And it was silver coins which were used across Europe for hundreds of years, first of all. In fact, uh, the uh, dollar first gets a mention uh, in popular culture in Macbeth, uh, which is actually technically a, a bit of, of a puzzle because uh, Macbeth, if anybody who knows their Shakespeare, was set in the 11th century when dollars, dollars simply didn't exist. But that's artistic license for you. It came to America via the Coinage Act of 1792. And who do we have to thank for that? Well, again, we've got to go look at uh, the West End stage, or indeed even Broadway. Alexander Hamilton, uh, a man currently having a, a great renaissance on the stage, thanks to a very popular musical. Um, and it was him that brought the dollar to America as its currency. It wasn't all been plain sailing. We'll see the Depression put a bit of a dent in the dollar's popularity and its standing. But, as many of you in this room will know, the dollar's eminence was basically cemented uh, post-World War II at the Bretton Woods Conference, a conference named after the town in which it was held, uh, which really sought to make, uh, you know, to get lasting peace, lasting stability for the globe. And therefore, the dollar became the currency of trade. It became the international reserve currency, and it was as good as gold as they termed it. Its value was linked to gold. It didn't last like that, but it was at the time. And uh, therefore, it was held by central banks in huge quantities to fund investment and trade. So in many ways, you could say that the victor of the Second World War was, in fact, the American currency. Uh, it was also the main victor of the Cold War. Um, of course, uh, a huge tussle there between the USSR, as it was, and the US. Uh, but even when that was going on in Moscow itself, uh, hotels, even prostitutes were accepting dollars. Why? Because that hard currency uh, promised you an entirely different lifestyle. When there were shortages on shelves, you could go into dollar stores and buy yourself goods that simply weren't available to everybody else. Of course, it's not always been great. It was also the conduit for the great financial crisis in 2008. But, and this is one of the really interesting things about the dollar, its image remains untainted by that. It didn't mean that any other currency got to steal a march on all of that. Let's talk a bit more about the Depression there, because uh, those were the kind of, you know, those were the kind of headlines you're looking at there. And the interesting thing about the Depression, no one's quite sure how the Great Depression actually came about. That's one of the really fascinating things about it. What the people do agree on, though, is that the focus on the dollar actually made things worse. Stock markets lost about a quarter of their value, almost a quarter of their value, in the course of just a few days back then. Uh, what also happened then is that investors turned their attention to the dollar and thought, right, that's it. We're trading our dollars. We've got no more confidence in dollars. We're going to give them up, trade them in for gold. OK, so what does the American Central Bank do? It puts up interest rates because of any student of economics can tell you, you put up interest rates that should attract more money into your currency because you get better returns. And therefore, you're protecting the value of your currency, shoring up the value of the dollar. That was the theory, but uh, I'm sure all the economic students could also tell you that the impact of doing that uh, on the real economy is something quite different. This is what happened, of course. What we saw there was unemployment, 23% of the population unemployed. And even those people who had a job in Depression-era America, working part-time, we saw output slumping. Um, you know, it, it was a very painful time indeed. The dollar's image had been tarnished, and it took a long time to actually pick it up, uh, GDP dropping by about 30%. So the focus on the dollar meant a hefty price, and they were the people who were paying it. It took Bretton Woods uh, to sort that all out, get the dollar back on top after the Second World War, of course, retain uh, that image. But... When you look at the dollar, you can see, just by looking at that dollar note, if you're ever stuck in a queue outside JFK or any other immigration in the US, um, you might as well just flip over a dollar note, spend a few minutes looking at it, because it's really interesting what you actually find when you take a closer look. Because on the back, I don't know if you can see it, there we go, you've got this mysterious symbol there, which, and again, the origins of this aren't quite known. 1935, we do know that this came about under FDR. 
And what you've got there is uh, the part of the Great Seal. You've got an eye and a pyramid. And no one's quite sure why that's there. Some say it's a, a sonic symbol, but on the other hand, the man who put it there wasn't a mason. So what is it doing there? Well, if you take a look at what it actually means, it's part of the Great Seal. Now, at the top there, you've got the eye. And you say, saying there, meaning God favors our undertaking. Underneath, you've got the New World Order. And that pretty sums up, really, what a dollar note is all about. Uh, because, um, you know, of course, the greenback presides over our global financial system. It still does. It's probably going to remain doing that for some time. And as for the eye on top, well, the dollar, as we'll see, gives the US some extraordinary policing powers over the rest of the globe. It is the world's financial policeman, and it's all because of this dollar. So regardless of where it came from, it's a pretty apt way of summing up the implications of having that dollar. But the dollar is much more than that. It may be the face of American might and interests, but uh, it brings not just spending power, but also influence and, of course, it dictates power and all our fortunes. In total, there are close to 12 billion $1 notes swilling around the system at any one time. That doesn't sound like a lot of money when you consider the size of uh, the American economy. We're just talking about the notes here. Okay, we're not talking about the electronic stuff there at all. Um, so I decided that, you know, if you want to explain how the global economy works, what glues us all together, what makes the global economy actually keep going, you have to look at the, at the journey of a dollar. And it's not just in America. It's the way that the dollar impacts on transactions around the globe. And it's individual transactions. We're not talking about, you know, pressing a button in a, on a trading floor somewhere. Um, so I'm going to take a bit of a whistle-stop tour, as I do in my book. And, of course, we've only got a few minutes to do that. So we're very much picking out the highlights. But just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that impact on the global economy and all our fortunes. So let's start in the home of the big spender itself. Let's start in America. Uh, and let's start by talking about a shopping trip that, you know, frankly, is familiar to all of us. You go and uh, spend, anybody who's been to Ikea knows you come out having spent more than you went in planning to. It's very easy to pick up those things, chuck them in the basket at the end. I started by looking at Walmart and looking at a, a, an American shopper who goes in there, heading to the checkout, picks up a radio, puts it in, it's only a few dollars, she wants to listen to music while she's uh, cooking the dinner. Um, we've all done that before. She's not really thinking about the implications of her purchase. But it does matter. What matters is not so much really about you know, what the radio means to her. It's about where it comes from. And that radio, like many other things, of course, is made in China. So that is where the dollar heads first of all. So it's an interesting journey from Texas to Beijing. Millions of transactions happening, cheap, cheap Chinese imports all over America, being put into shopping trolleys. And uh, what does that mean? What does that tell us about the impact on America? Well, make America great again. We're hearing all about steel tariffs at the moment. We're hearing all about trade wars, perhaps, exploding as we speak. One study thinks that, in actual fact, if you look at how much Walmart, Walmart itself buys more from China than the whole of Germany does, right? One study reckons that if Walmart didn't do that, there'd be 400,000 more jobs in the US. Is that true? Debatable. Um, and of course, that has led to all kinds of unrest about the fact that there is unfair competition, that frankly, if people bought China, uh, American, those jobs would be there. People would have their incomes. It's a bit more complicated than that, of course, because the idea of having cheap Chinese imports means that uh, the cost of living is lower, higher standards of living. And it means that Americans can focus on other things. And um, you know, China can make most things cheaper than America. But still, it buys Boeing planes. It buys planes from America. Why does it do that? It's all about specialization. It's all about comparative advantage. The fact that ultimately, America can make planes more efficiently uh, than China can. That could change, of course. But how does America become great again? How do you protect your incomes of your workers? Is it all about building those walls, putting some charges on your, uh, on your imports, slapping on tariffs? As we're hearing at the moment, probably not. Free trade has come a long way in recent decades, and there is a reason for that, because ultimately, you put charges on the things you're bringing into your country, and you find that, in actual fact, over there, they're going to put uh, charges on Levi jeans, 
uh, Harley Davidson motorbikes, orange juice. It sounds a bit of a random list, but it's all quite strategic. Europe would put charges on imports that are going to hurt those states in the US that Trump's relying on most for voters, right? So it's strategic. Ultimately, who pays the price for that? Consumers pay the price. Higher charges, fewer jobs ultimately because output is less, because demand is less. So it's not surprising that, in actual fact, when you look at what happened last time around, they tried to put uh, steel tariffs on 2002 under Bush, lasted months, didn't really work out. So while well, China's rubbing its hands with glee, again, great, we've got all this American business, we've got this business from Walmart, uh, don't forget that the whole time others are coming up behind it. So that does actually threaten its position. Uh, for Walmart, this is a marriage made in heaven at the moment, of course, because, you know, it's got over 100 million bargain-hungry customers coming in every week, and their slogan is always low prices. You want to deliver that, it means you're buying from China. They've now got various vessels and things in place, which means that it takes just five days from getting something from China over to a Walmart store. And uh, it's a major reason why you see that trade gap, that trade deficit with America. But it's not a static situation, because even though we've got 20,000 suppliers there in China selling to Walmart, they're constantly being undercut. Vietnam, Bangladesh, they're all coming up around the outside, even as wages go up in China and we see things changing there. So, our dollar goes to China, and look at that, you know, People's Bank of China. All those great signs of great fortunes. They look very imposing indeed, but inside those buildings, what people are really worried about are dollars, right? And that's because China's got, of course, a very unique take on how to actually manage those dollars and what it's going to do with them. I know, its factory base has grown fat on those dollars it's earning from American consumers, not just American consumers, of course, British ones as well, around the world. Um, but now it's looking at how it can actually use that money, and it's been quite an interesting thing. Because what happens to those dollars? Well, it's harnessed them for export earnings. And of course, the exporters don't get to keep those dollars. They, they, they basically go into the system and they get the money back they need to pay workers and the rest of it. But the government, the central bank, is holding on tight to those dollars. And um, it's controlling its exchange rate. Why? Partly to make those exports cheaper, ensure that they actually can, you know, remain attractive on the global market. But also, they're not just keeping the dollars under a mattress. They're investing them. They're buying up American debt in the form of government bonds. Uh, you know, Uncle Sam's a safe bet. It means you get a good return on your money. Uh, it also means, effectively, in theory, you're holding America to ransom in some ways. You're, you know, owning their debt. But also, you can use those dollars to invest abroad. And this is a really interesting bit, because for China, dollars are also the key to growing its economic empire because they're so widely accepted. So from there, this is the, actually, you know, unless you're around in Roman times, you won't really remember the old Silk Road, but that was the uh, old trade route. This is, this is China's new Silk Road, right? This is the maritime routes, and also you can see there the land ones as well. This is what it's trying to pump money into at the moment um, to try and build new trading routes. It's seen as controversial, suspicious even by some, though. Why? Well, it's about what this actually means. It's not just about getting goods around. It's not just about, you know, making sure that China's factories are supplied in the right way. It's about growing China's influence abroad. That map actually doesn't cover where the dollar heads next, which is all the way to, hmm, Nigeria. OK. Um, why? Well, China's got a fascination with building a railroad that goes from uh, Calabar, which is a port town, uh, a party town, in fact, if you have a, it's a big tourist destination now as well, to Lagos. Not because, you know, the Chinese in any way are thinking about tourism over there. It crosses some very important parts of Nigeria. In particular, it crosses the oil region. So it gives China access to Nigeria's markets. It means it, you know, has more presence, therefore more influence over uh, the oil fields there, you know, they're buying for contracts, might they get a look in. It also means more work for Chinese uh, companies, more work for Chinese workers as well. Also, it means access to Nigeria's booming markets as well. If you go and buy traditional printed cloth in Nigerian markets, it used to all be sort of homegrown and, uh, you know, a, a pretty big empire, uh, industry. Now, 
the market's being flooded with cheap Chinese imports. So Nigeria's not entirely happy about that. But on the other hand, Nigeria gets its infrastructure. It gets investment in a railroad which is cutting down journey times. It's more than halving journey times, in actual fact. It doesn't just carry freight, it carries people as well. And for China, building a railroad in Nigeria is a form of soft power. We think of soft power diplomacy, we think about you know, broadcasting links, things like the World Service, for example. Those are soft power we're used to. You've got railroads as well. But why does Nigeria need that money? It's got all this oil, right? But it's concentrated in a few hands. And around the outside, of course, you've got ethnic tensions, you've got, you've got huge problems, in fact, with the economy, uh, with malnourishment and the rest of it. So, uh, Nigeria, it's a welcome hand. But you know, it brings up the question, aid or trade, right? Aid or investment? And many would say that, in actual fact, aid has its drawbacks. It comes with strings attached. It's somehow misappropriated on the ground. Sometimes it's aimed to the wrong areas. On the other hand, investment, too, comes with strings attached. Because Nigeria, in taking that dollar, is giving up some power over to China. Okay, so next, where does that dollar go? Well, Nigeria, uh, Nigerian national dish, rice, okay? Uh, but that rice tends to come not from its own shores, it tends to come from uh, India. And uh, this is a really interesting part of it, actually, because you look at India and massive swathes of land, right? It should be the world's rice bowl. It's got lots of hungry mouths to feed. They've got massive farms, you know, almost half the population work in farming, but it can't feed itself. It's a huge conundrum. And it's thrown up all sorts of questions about whether or not uh, India should remain as a farming nation. Why is it that India can't farm itself when it's got so many people working on the land there, as you can see? In actual fact, its farms are less than 10% as productive as um, America's. And it just doesn't have the infrastructure. So in actual fact, even though when you do see farms coming up and producing their output, almost half it rots by the time it gets to ports because they don't have the storage facilities, they don't have the roads, there isn't the money to simply build that and there isn't, hasn't been the will so far. And that means, of course, what you get is small subsistence farmers, many of whom uh, live in huge poverty. So we have got huge trading links between Nigeria and India. But what we've got is a very strange model here, because normally what you get with economies like India's, and don't forget India is the fastest growing major economy, we're told. But it's done it by a very strange route, because normally you go agriculture, industrial revolution, services, digital revolution, right? India seems to have skipped some of those steps. And when you talk about you know, the Indian success story, everyone thinks of Bangalore. And it thinks of you know, the, the idea that we have these outsourcing um, call centers, Walmart, for example, there's a center in, in Bangalore which sits there, pouring over the data coming out of stores in Texas, working out how to lay out stores to maximize sales. That's in Bangalore, that's not in Texas, that's you know, on the other side of the world. Most of the people in that call center have never even been to Texas. So it's a, it's a very strange model, but it's not a sustainable one, because in actual fact, a tiny proportion of the population work in the IT industry in India. That is not the way. So, the Indian government's having to revisit this one now and say, well, we need to up our productivity in agriculture. We need, perhaps, even to have an industrial revolution. Talking about Davos, it was quite interesting being there at the same time as the Indian Premier and seeing everywhere these big stalls setting up saying, you know, invest in India. We're open for business. And that seems to be very much uh, the way things are going there. So they're having a bit of a rethink there, that perhaps you do need to have some kind of an industrial revolution. But that will take a lot of money. It'll take investment from outside, it'll take investment from inside, it will take political will, it will take the right kind of infrastructure as well. But it's one to watch, obviously. And having industrial revolution, ha building your infrastructure means that you need to actually have a few materials at your hand. One of those, if you're building roads, and the government's got a very ambitious road building program, you've got to have oil. So our dollar's heading next to Iraq. And, here we go. It's neck and neck who gets to sell more oil, but occasionally it's Iraq that takes the lead. Iraq, and these are the oil fields uh, near Basra, uh, and it's an interesting case study this because the oil they sell, oil comes in lots of different grades, and uh, the finest stuff is what we have in our cars. The heaviest stuff, the coarsest stuff, is great for building roads. It's also a bit cheaper, <laughs> which is why India buys quite so much of it from Iraq. 
Oil, obviously crucial to global development, as we know. Anybody who studied the oil price shocks knows that. Why is it priced in dollars? Well, it was a deal done back in the 70s, and you know, America gets to have its currency all over the oil price. Saudi got to have various corporations. It got the protection of, it, of America. Um, it got various uh, advantages like that as well. OPEC, of course, has been a big force here. Many say that it doesn't control the oil price in the same way as it used to because demand and supply have changed a lot. Um, and we know that, for example, shale has come on stream. And um, if you look at where America's going, that's upsetting the balance in a big way. Is having oil a good thing? Well, <laughs> ask Iraq, probably not always, right? Because when you look at what happens to oil producing nations, it is quite interesting that, in actual fact, it's not always been a great thing. Nigeria can vouch for that. You look at the unrest there. Iraq's another one. If you look at what's happened with IS in the last few years, and for them, the oil fields of Iraq have been a major source of finance. Even there's Dutch disease. If we go back to the discovery of oil in the Netherlands, um, which drove up the exchange rate there and punished the real economy. So. Um, it's in huge demand, but oil, it's the paradox of plenty. It's the curse of black gold. It comes with goods and bads. And unfortunately for Iraq, it's found out to its price that actually it can be quite a dangerous thing because of the interest in IS. And that means that whereas Iraq might have wanted to use the dollars it's earned from selling that barrel of oil to an actual fact, building up its infrastructure, get its country back on its feet, it's having to invest it in something wholly different, and that is defending its oil field. So it's off to Russia. Okay. And these guys here. Russia's involvement with the defense industry goes back uh, decades, if not centuries. And this is obviously the legacy of the Cold War. In the Soviet era, you had you know, huge planning operations with factories like those where it was dictated how much you produce, how you'd produce it. Uh, also, every inch of your lives, they even provided housing, they provided your fridges, they provided your washing machines, you named it, they controlled everything. Uh, when the Cold War came to an end, Russia kept that specialization. In fact, it focused so much on creating the means of destruction, it wasn't actually good at manufacturing anything else. So even now, um, if you look at actually what Russia exports in terms of manufactured goods, weapons are up there, they're the top grade. And that's not really changing uh, very much at all. Who does it sell to? Well, it's interesting because it is the world's second largest producer of arms. It sells to its friends. So, you know, the US has got uh, NATO stitched up. Russia's got uh, much of the developing world. Uh, but it's a risky business because, of course, uh, others want to produce weapons and as Russia has found to its peril. In fact, if we go to Iraq and um, during the Gulf uh, War, what we found was a lot of badly uh, guarded weaponry. So when it came to IS, they were able to help themselves. As some said, it was like kids in the sweet shop. So ironically, you've got Iraqi troops with Russian arms staring down the barrel of guns that were made in uh, Russia. So it's the dark side of the world economy. And Russia is one of those countries that is very dependent on oil for its export earnings. But it's also dependent on weaponry. And it's got to diversify. So. Um, that's something that you know, Russia has got to focus on. It's became the gunmaker to the world. As we're saying as well, it's had a fairly unstable past. The ruble has had a lot of problems over the years. The dollar thrived because of that during the Cold War, as I was saying. You know, it was a hard currency stores in Moscow. And it throws up all sorts of questions. And there's something I talk about in the book about what is a dollar note actually worth? What, what, what does money actually mean? And money has a number of, of functions. It's got to be a store of value. It's got to be something that's acceptable means of exchange. And it's got to be something you can use to repay debt, for example. And most currencies fit that bill, but the dollar bill fits it better than most. And that means that's another reason why the dollar is the world's currency. It's also got an interesting side effect, the dollar. Uh, it means that America is allowed to be the world's financial policeman. How? Well, if anything touches the US financial system, comes under the American jurisdiction. So if anybody remembers the, uh, the raids on FIFA a couple of years ago to do with the bribery and corruption scandal there, it was actually the American authorities who were behind that. They don't really care about football. They call it soccer. Uh, but for them, that idea that dollars were used in bribes and it touched American banks meant that they were the ones who were going to police it. It was that outrageous and offensive to them. 
Russia, of course, having a bit of a hard time, sanctions because of its involvement uh, in Ukraine and impacting on the economy quite a bit. Uh, impacting largely, um, of course, on uh, the government, on, on private companies, but also on, uh, on individuals as well. And that's where I have a lot of questions because our dollar has gone to an arms maker in Russia. He's got that money. He wants to put it somewhere safe. He's a bit worried about the stability of the Russian economy. Where do you go? Well, how about Germany? Why Germany? Well, the two countries have quite a long and friendly relationship. Uh, okay. Looking very friendly there, uh, Putin and Merkel. And um, well, always so friendly. In fact, one of the earliest pictures of the two of them together was of Merkel, his black Labrador, and uh, sorry, Putin, his black Labrador, and Angela Merkel. And uh, the story goes that uh, Angela Merkel has been petrified of dogs since she was bitten, and Putin brought along his dog to terrorize her. I'm not sure if that's what worked, or the fact that, in actual fact, Germany is so dependent on Russia for its energy. But because of that, the two of them tend to have a closer relationship than many. And what it does mean, of course, is that when it came to sanctions, Germany was quite reticent compared to others, saying, hang on a minute. Moment. Don't go too far with this. Don't penalise them too far. Because Russia has that power to turn the lights off, in theory. Um, and because of that, it also means that individual um, Russians, they're looking somewhere to put their money, and they're not affected by sanctions, might look at, for example, the German property market. So that's something uh, that we talk about. And if you look at the money that's going into Germany, yeah, the private money's going in from Russia. Uh, half of the money going from Russia to Germany, though, it, comes from oil companies, comes from um, the energy giants who are doing things like taking stakes in refineries. The German economy is a really fascinating one, and uh, it too has benefited a lot from the dollar. The Marshall Plan came about after the Second World War, um, when it, there was talk of you know, restructuring uh, the, or rebuilding the German economy. How do you do that? Well, you put money into it. But where did that money come from? It came from an American. Um, government official who decided that you know it's time to flood the equipment what is now 170 billion dollars uh, into the uh, German economy you might think that's you know, very generous very nice but it was more about stopping the spread of communism and actually making sure there was a market out there for American made goods at the time but it helped Germany become the industrial giant we now know and it then became of course uh, the leading light in the EC the EC and then the Euro project. And uh, one of the things we talk about in the book is um, the single market, free movement of goods and people, and this whole debate about the price of mass migration and the fact that you know, you've got economies like Germany, aging populations, you need workers, you need skilled workers, bringing in workers from elsewhere does boost your income. On the other hand, the other argument goes, can your public services stand it in the age of austerity? It's a big debate. And then, of course, came about the Euro. Right, so um, the year is born. Everyone said, American central bankers went, that's it. Our days and the sun's gone. The year is going to take over. Didn't quite happen. Lots of reasons for that. Of course, the, uh, the euro represented lots of different economies at different stages. Uh, the start of the project, the, the criteria for actually entering the euro fudged, of course. And of course, you've got different political systems as well. It's entirely different to the US. So it started off on the back foot in many ways, and then came along the financial crisis, and the fault lines in the whole Euro project were then laid bare. So you then had Greece, you had Germany, and that affected the credibility soon. So, so far, we have not seen the Euro up there rivaling the dollar in any way uh, for poll position, but that could all change, of course. At the moment, our dollar is now in uh, a pension fund. It's gone from buying property in Germany, it's gone to a pension fund, and then it goes over to the UK to be invested. This is a really interesting one because, of course, the UK didn't join the euro, and we were told at the time this could threaten the uh, dominance of the UK as a financial centre. In actual fact, it's gone even further. We're actually now a bigger financial centre than we were. Why? That's some subject of much debate. But uh, you know, we were having this conversation before we came up here, and the fact that London, many of us say, is the best city to live in the world. Um, we could say it's that. We could also say that we're conveniently located in, in the middle of time zones, and we have a common language in much of the world. Deregulation, of course, big bang, uh, allowed the financial system to explode. 
and we saw complex products coming up at a faster rate than they could be regulated. And that, of course, was part of the reason we saw the financial crisis. Um, that and the fact that uh, we saw loans being made to American homeowners that they simply couldn't afford. So they couldn't afford to pay back their loans. Those loans had been bundled up into complex financial products, which was passed on from institution to institution around the globe. Those institutions didn't understand them either. So when these repayments failed to come about, what happened instead? Well, the domino effect happens. And we see homeowners here suffering. We see people queues outside Northern Rock. We see people who can't get their money out of banks. We see Greek pensioners suffering. The dollar was a conduit for all of that, of course. Can it happen again? Well, we've got more regulation now. We've got arguably better regulation, but we've also got a financial system we know can be one step ahead of regulation. And debt is built up yet again. You know, the dollar, I said, was a conduit. It was imaginary money at the time, wasn't it? It was that created money. It was a debt. And we had that debt once again. Big question now, can London regain its position post-Brexit? Who knows? We've had the chance of talking yesterday. Oh, they said it couldn't stay with the way it was ahead of not joining the euro. But um, let's see. At the moment, we know that bankers prefer to live here, perhaps to Frankfurt. Many of them do. But it's one of those things that we have to wait and see. So there we have it. That's our uh, financial system. What about our dollar? Well, it's being invested in a bank, in our financial system here. But businesses are worried about the future after Brexit. So um, what I wrote about was a business person saying, well, I've got to go and explore opportunities over in the US. And that means I'm going to take a dollar out and spend it. So the dollar travels back to the US. And what do we find when we get there? Well, our business person goes and stays in a hotel in Houston, gets a great uh, restaurant tip, and uh, gives that uh, dollar to the concierge, who just happens to be our Walmart shopper. So the dollar's gone full circle. And what have we learned along the way? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a series of transactions that happens all the time. And we gripe about being a consumer economy. We gripe about the money, money we spend. Americans, of course, spend about one in every six dollars of the world of the world's GDP, so we can't neglect them by any means. But we, along the way, what's become clear is that the dollar is dominant. And globalization does shape all our fortunes. It shapes all those various forces that affect our jobs. It affects our property prices. It affects the prices of things we pay in the shops. They're all the things we, you know, we take for granted almost. The world is reliant on the dollar to grease the wheels of commerce and finance. And uh, we can't get away from it. You may not be holding a dollar, you may not even be looking at one, but we're reliant on it whether, whether you want to escape poverty, whether you want to develop your economy, whether you want to grow your economic influence and empire. Also, it's the way the world's policed and we need it to trade. We also need it to create and mend financial crisis because it was the creation, of course, of quantitative easing of that extra money which gave the world's economy a kick start. But above all, it's an addiction to debt that keeps those wheels turning. It's an addiction to dollars, as it was pre-crisis. Now, history, trade, and politics dictates the dollar reigns supreme, could be one, or even digital currencies threaten that. I'd say not at the moment, but who knows? We could be having an entirely different conversation. It could not be the almighty dollar for much longer. We could be talking about perhaps the demise of the dollar in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darshini. Um, that was a wonderfully interesting uh, presentation. Tracing the dollar around the world illuminates many of um, the key issues we have to address about globalization today. So now we're going to open uh, the floor to questions. Um, we Please do say your name and affiliation. Please wait for the microphone uh, to uh, reach you, but perhaps as a uh, the chair, I can start, um, jumpstart the question session uh, with, you know, this, this wonderful kind of presentation of what it really means to internationalize a currency, you know. Uh, this is definitely uh, the power of being able to internationalize a currency that has the safety, liquidity, um, and tradability of a currency that really no other currency can rival. Um, so. Uh, you have illustrated many examples of why that is useful. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of curious, you, you mentioned about China and Russia and how, how the dollar plays a role, but you know, in, in the sense, 
China is simply producing more than it can possibly consume. So the rest of it just flows out of the country and finds its way, um, either through goods or capital, mm -hmm. to many places around the world. And whether it's the dollar or something else, actually, they would love it for it to be their RMB. Right? They would love it for it to be the, the domestic currency. Um, so um, how do you think about the fact that generally there's a fundamental economic you know, underpinning structure behind globalization of countries like China producing a lot, consuming little, saving a lot, and just, you know, kind of dominating the world in that fashion, whether it is through the dollar or, or not. It's a bit of a, I mean, it's interesting what you say about uh, they, they'd love the RMB to be, I mean, the thing with the dollar is the dollar is dominant, but the American economy, to, uh, American government to a certain extent has had to give up control to get that. And you know, it means allowing other people to, to do what they like almost with your currency in a way that the Chinese government isn't you know, at the moment committed to being able to relinquish that control. So therefore, you, do, you get those very different forces. Um, China's changing, obviously. You know, as you're saying, it's producing more than it can consume. That's changing. We're all going to have to adjust to that. And that's going to cause shifts as well. Um, but uh, I think in, ter in terms of globalization and those kind of forces it's it's uh you know for america they consume they're not ready to give up on that they consume and therefore they know in return what you have to do is sacrifice your currency almost it will be very interesting to see how the disengagement of the u.s on the world stage will affect uh mm. the dominant use of the dollar one interesting fact is actually uh, countries with their own nuclear you know nuclear states versus countries that rely on the u.s for security there's a big difference in terms of how many dollars uh, they hold. But yes, they do. Are, yes, yeah, no, those are interesting. So, so um, over to you guys. Um, any questions? Please. Um, I wonder whether your presentation really shows that the dollar is almighty, it might be all pervasive, but um, it seems that the links are what's almighty rather than the dollar itself. The dollar is just the mechanism. It's not an explanation. The dollar is a mechanism, but it is also, it all depends all this, so therefore it is almighty. I mean, I think there's two things here. There is the, uh, there's the presence in the dollar. It's the catalyst for making this all happen. There's also the value of the dollar, which is an entirely separate thing. And obviously, part of making, the irony is that part of making America great again, you say you cannot have a mighty dollar in terms of its value, because that's not good for the American economy. Um, but I disagree. I think it, you know, it is the linkage, but it is also the thing that underpins it. How many links would you have to break? I think, you know, for a start, you'd have to have oil that's not priced in dollars, right? You need to have a more serious... At the moment, you haven't got a contender. You haven't... The, the you know, the RMB isn't there. The euro isn't there. Digital currencies, you know, uh, are pipe dream at the moment. <laughs> that's debatable, but... <laughs> debatable. <laughs> Inevitable, but at the moment, I mean, the, the, as I was saying there, the whole thing about dollars, money, has to be acceptable, right? And the transaction costs of making any kind of digital currency transaction at the moment, and the fact that you can't, you can't walk down the road and spend it uh, in Pizza Express or buy yourself a pint of beer with it. We've got a long way to go with that. Next question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, would you like to take the podium? <laughs> All right, um, another Sorry question. About that. Second question, please. Maybe someone from this side. Second row, lady. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought it was. I thought it was really interesting in um, in your talk. You mentioned the EU tactics on um, specifically putting tariffs on the products that are made in the states where Trump's supporters are mainly concentrated. And I was wondering if you've seen that use similarly in Brexit negotiations or if it's just a completely different type of conversation? Um, I think, uh, obviously, we, uh, when it comes to the Brexit conversations, we're at a different stage with that at the moment. Uh, but I'm sure that will be a tactic. 
that she used. And, and you know, clearly, financial services, as I mentioned there, is the key one. If you want to hit us where it hurts, hit us with something on financial services there. You know, our, our government's saying you know, what we want is this wholly ambitious um, free trade agreement, which will do something that no one's ever done before. We're going to have financial services in there. It'll all be great. And, of course, the instant reaction was that really would be the cherry on the cake and you're not going to get it. That's what would hurt us. That is our Levi's jeans. That is our Harley Davidson's. Um, but you're right. I mean, you know, what we saw during the Bush um, administration's attempts to put uh, tariffs on was we had exactly that kind of retaliation. And yeah, that, that was the reason everyone had to kind of go back off because those were the swing states effectively that were affected. In the same way, you're going to see, Europe knows where our, our weak spots are. Um, and uh, unfortunately, much as we don't want to admit it, I'm afraid we are going to have to be a rule taker on that. Uh, you know, we, we can set out all the demands we want to, but they're going to turn around and go, no, these are our red lines too. Thanks very much. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, could, <clears throat> could you say a few words about the creation of, of the, of, of, of a currency and who de and how the uh, the decision to determine the quantity um, is 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 made um, now we all know that central banks play that leading role and um, we s we've seen what happens in Zimbabwe and, and more recently in Venezuela when a government is dire need of funding they just print more money and that destroys the currency doesn't it but my understanding is that commercial Commercial banks create most of the money in, in a, in, that flows within a society because they only have, a ten, say, a 10% regulatory requirement mm. for liquidity. So if, if a, say, a, a million pounds are going into a, pe uh, a, a bank at the end of the month through people's paychecks, well, th they could release 10 times that amount, couldn't they? They can, yeah, absolutely, and that, that's the way the financial system is set up to work. But as you say, there are there are reserve, there are limits there on how much they've got to hold, and that dictates how much they can create on top of that as well. Um, but it's interesting, you know, we talk about people talk about QE and they talk about printing money, and of course that's not technically what it is. It's it, governments creating money, but in a wholly kind of uh, controlled way uh, to grease the wheels. Um, but sorry, your first part of the question, I, I missed that about who dictates how currency is created. Uh, so the central banks, the Bank of England, mm -hmm. and uh, the QE, so they were, per people say they were printing money, but they were 30% corporate bonds. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And giving it, and, and, and the liquidity to the banks with the intention of lending it out. Yes. Which they didn't do. They didn't do, no, they, they, they yeah, that, that was, um, I mean, effectively, it is the creation of money, you say. I mean, whether we want to call it printing money or not, it's the creation of bonds. Uh, but what the central banks couldn't control is where that money went. And to this day, we do not know. And that's one of the things I've talked about in the book, is that even the Bank of England, when it looks at where did the money go, it can't account for a lot of it. And what do we think it's gone? We think perhaps you know, the banks, the institutions that got it, they didn't lend it out. They, they Perhaps it got invested into various assets, and you look at various asset classes, you can see how their prices have risen, and you go, yep, that was the impact of QE. But it's one of those things you feel like, you know, we'll be looking at it uh, in the same way we now look back at the Great Depression and go, okay, this is what history has taught us. We'll be looking at it in 50 years' time and go, oh, that's where the money went. And it's a very, uh, it was a blunt tool, put it that way. Okay, any other questions? Yes. So... When is a time where we start seeing con um, different countries just as one single country? Because in the past, pounds were separate from each other and they grouped together. So when do we try and stop asking the question of ending world poverty? Because um, do you see how towns in the past did different functions? Some were industrial, some were commercial, some had different ways. When, is the, when do we stop trying to focus on world poverty, ending that? and instead just accepting that different countries will be poor forever because they serve different functions. So you're saying that basically diff because different nations are different that therefore... Yeah, they through globalisation, as we all become connected, we have to accept that in some countries will take the position of being poor. Because of market forces and, and therefore that's the way it'll go. 
it's happening. That kind of thing is happening. Um, but can I, can I make a plug for another book while I'm here? Uh, which is that um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Tim Marshall, has written this really interesting book about the creation of walls in the current age called, um, it's called, uh, oh, I'm completely blank. Divided, thank you, thanks, thanks. Divided, which is a really fascinating look at how, in actual fact, instead of globalization bringing us together, we are becoming more disparate. And it's partly because of competing forces and inequality and the fact that we cannot accept the way things are going at the moment. Worth a read. Okay, in the back. Um, do you know a thing called uh, Mart to Market and Accounting? I'm sorry? It's, it's Mart to Market and Accounting. It, 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 was, it was abolished in the US in 1938 and they brought it back in in 2007. But if you don't, don't worry. Um, but you, you missed out some things. The Federal Reserve, the, the, the US government print money from basically nothing. And they give it to the Treasury, Treasury to the banks, the banks to the Federal Reserve. And then it's lent out to business and people. And it just recycles all the time. Mm. So, I mean, um, by, like, they closed in the last 25 years, or 30 years, they, they closed thousands of factories in America and transported them over to China so that so the people at the top would increase their profits. And also, doesn't it expand the, the credit that you can give out to people? It, the credit part, and so so as long as the, as long as you have credit, they have you, you know, they have you in the trap. Yeah. And if you go against the dollar and try to trade another way, America will go to war with you. So they are controlling you. They are controlling, as we've seen, or as some people say in some parts of the world where there has been war in the last 20 years, that they try to trade their oil in some other way, apart from dollars. So. Aren't people under the thumb of, um, of the American whoever government runs or the, dollar? the Federal Reserve who get a 6%? They get a 6% return on their money um, every year. Uh, yeah, and a, a lot of that I do, I mean, obviously, I've been talking for, what, 40 minutes, but in the book, I go into a lot of that in a lot more detail, um, is, is, is the short answer to that one. Uh, and don't forget, I, it was very much a whistle-stop tour that I gave you there. But no, absolutely. I mean, the, what, there are point, elements of what you've said that I would agree with that, in actual fact. Uh, that is the way that the American uh, economy's gone. I mean, I talked about, um, you know, Walmart. And that whole empire was born on this idea of piling it high, selling it cheap, but making profits for the family that ran it, right? Yeah. And that meant selling out to China. I'm sorry? Capitalism. <laughs> okay, um, shall we move on to the next question, please? Yes, please. In the interest of time, I'll probably collect two more. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I, read, I read the book, which I enjoyed. I thought it was an imaginative way of explaining economics, which I didn't have a lot of when I was studying here. Um, so my question is about gold. So I'm not sure, that, I can't remember how much you covered that, but. A while ago, I, I read a story about Germany asking for some of its gold from the US and finding out that the US couldn't quite locate where some of the gold after the Second World War was. So I think Germany sent them a list because the gold bullion would have tag, right, so to, 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 to recognize Germany because Germany lent it to Germany to, to the US during the war and so on. Anyway, so it turns out that Germany has requested, I think, for some of its gold to be returned following that sort of lack of proper accounting. And also, I know that people talk about China building up gold. So, so I guess my question is, if we can't think forward to the digital currencies, and I think you talk about how the delinking of gold to the dollar is something that maybe helped the dollar free itself, is that maybe a risk for the, do for the dollar, maybe? Gold becoming stronger on the stage, maybe China having more reserves than anybody knows it has built up. Germany asking for some gold that maybe the US doesn't have anymore. I'm not accusing the government of the US of Selling oh, of gold. hiding the gold under the bed. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Is that maybe something that could threaten the US if it's seen as destable and people go to the right? I don't think so. Although, having said that, um, flows of gold uh, actually have a much bigger impact on our economies than we like to think. I mean, 
there's some interesting stuff in the last quarter's GDP figures for the UK. When you look at the way that changes in, I have to get this one right, because it's quite a difficult one. There's various ways they look at the flows of gold. And if you hold gold for personal reasons, it's classed quite differently to other types of gold. But the investment flows of gold can add 0.3, 0.4% to your GDP growth, or take it away, depending on which direction it's flowing. In. So you make a very valid point that, in actual fact, flows of gold can potentially be destabilizing. Is it enough to threaten the position of the financial viability of the US economy? So I think you're saying, I don't, I don't think so, no. no. It's not quite that big, no. OK, we have time for one last question. In front, in front, in front. No, 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 in front. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before that China was investing quite heavily into Nigeria, and in fact, it's in, been investing quite a lot in Africa. But what, I, what you mentioned as well was that the method of investment was, was the dollar to secure soft diplomacy, as it were. But won't it make more sense to use China's own currency? Because surely, by investing with the dollar, you're making the countries reliant on the dollar, not China. And if they're invested in reliant on the dollar, which is fundamentally controlled by the US, in fact, they end up being influenced by the US instead of China. Yeah, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? I mean, there are, um, there's various currency swaps aren't there, between China and Nigeria, which mean that there are certain amounts you can do in trade directly. But it's a small amount. And of course, China has quite a tight grip on its currency, doesn't use it a lot. And, and the dollar is more easily accepted, is the shorthand answer to that. So it tends to be the common currency for things like that. But yeah, there will come a time when that happens, and, and there is work going on behind the scenes to make it happen. Well, thank you, Darshini. It will be really interesting to revisit all these questions in about 10 years' time Indeed. <laughs> uh, with the changing status of the U.S. and the global economy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Um, warm uh, gratitude to Darshini for her excellent presentation. Thank you.